Well, all right. Uh, I don't want to take forever reading uh, very long backgrounds. Suffice to say, Dr. Klatz is recognized as a leading authority in the new clinical science of anti-aging medicine. He has pioneered the exploration of new therapies for the treatment and prevention of age-related disease. President, founder of the American uh, Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, a scientific metal, medical uh, society which is exploring advances in biotechnology and preventative health care, Dr. Klatz oversees educational programs for more than 8,000 other doctors and scientists from 55 different countries. So this man obviously knows what he's talking about. He's been on the show before. Coming tonight with him is Dr. Vernon A. Howard, who's got a doctorate in the philosophy of science and has a special interest in the role of values in science. So you can see why he's going to be here tonight. Experience also in the arts, education, and social sciences. He is the author of eight books and many articles on a variety of topics, including learning and performance in the arts and in sport. Since 1996, he has been uh, Education Special Advisor to the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And you can imagine why. Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the program. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Since this is not television and we cannot pan back and forth so the audience knows who they're listening to, Dr. Klatz, um, say something. Hi, Dr. Klatz here. It's good to be on your show again, Art. It's uh, always a pleasure. And uh, now, for voice identification purposes, Dr. Howard. Yes, hello. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, adventure, I, w I would say. I, I, I'll wait to see if it's a pleasure. Yeah, coming, coming on this show is an adventure. That's right. Uh, it definitely is. And I don't know about the flesh bar. We'll find out. Right. Um, Dr. Klatz, I think it appropriate to begin by setting the stage for the audience by telling them where anti-aging medicine is right now and where we're going and when we're going to get there and what to expect. Well, thank you, Art. Yes. Um, I think in order to explain where anti-aging medicine is right now, we have to talk about where anti-aging medicine was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, anti-aging medicine was science fiction. It was um, wishful thinking at the very best. Fountain of youth stuff. Exactly, fountain of youth stuff. And uh, our, my colleagues in the medical profession were none too shy in reminding me of this fact uh, up until just two years ago that uh, this was uh, unscientific balderdash and this would not happen in our lifetime or our oh, children's really? lifetime or possibly even our grandchildren's lifetime. And so with the creation of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, uh, the first medical society, by the way, to take the position that aging is not inevitable in 1993. We began the society with just 12 doctors uh, at that time. Um, from that time, since 1993, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine has grown to an international medical society with now 8,500 physicians and scientists as members in 55 different countries around the world. And uh, anyone who's, who's read the news over the last year or two uh, realizes that anti-aging medicine has become mainstream rather rapidly. And uh, what the public is now uh, uh, beginning to understand because of the, uh, uh, the educational effort on the part of the media is, is that the technology that the Academy has been espousing and that um, uh, the people that I've had the pleasure of working with since 1981 have been espousing uh, the, the biomedical revolution is upon us, and it will make the computer revolution look like, uh, oh, a ho-hum, dull day at the park. Really? In comparison, yes, absolutely. I mean, realize that average life expectancy in the United States, and the U.S. had the highest life expectancy on the planet in the year 1900. Yes was only 46, 47 years of age. Today, it's 77 years of age. So we've gained about 30 years of life expectancy in just the last 100 years. Have we made an equivalent gain uh, or, or a parallel gain in the quality of life? Oh, yes, I think so. I actually, actually, I'm convinced of it. When I started practicing, when I started getting involved in medicine, uh, I, I was in, involved in this in a very early age, uh, and I was involved in intensive care medicine. I was uh, um, 
I used to work intensive care units and emergency rooms and things like that as a medical technician. Sure. Uh, this was about 25 years ago, and it was not uncommon 25 years ago to find the intensive care units filled with people who were in their 50s and 60s, in fact, even a few 40-year-olds with heart disease, stroke, uh, cancers, uh, lung diseases were quite prominent. I, I, I lived in the East Coast, and there was, there was still coal miners' lung and coal miner uh, inhalation problems. Uh, you know, at that time. Today, if you go into most intensive care units, uh, it's rare to find people in there uh, who are under the age of, of 60. Uh, most of the intensive care unit um, occupants are in their 70s and their 80s today. A few in their 60s, but not a lot. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing this ratcheting upward uh, of, of the diseases of aging. And I think it's very important that we understand that because when the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine began its message uh, to the public, the message was that aging was not inevitable, that what we consider to be natural aging may in fact simply be a constellation of degenerative diseases uh, that ultimately lead, or degenerative um, uh, metabolic function that ultimately lead to disease and finally to death. And when we start talking that way, I mean, we raised the, uh, we raised, uh, the hairs on the back of a lot of our scientific colleagues' neck and took a lot of heat from the media. Okay, but let, this is where I have a hard time understanding this. Uh, I know that we have conquered many diseases. We probably uh, have a cleaner environment in which to live, he says, in one way. In other words... Uh, uh, we have vitamins. Uh, we, we do things that we didn't do way back then. Um, things that uh, have extended our lives to the, the the point you just mentioned a moment ago, the average lifespan. Right. Um, but have we really opened the door, really opened the door, to anti-aging? Uh, you, you, you told us where it is. We know where it is now. How far ahead is the door to the first big step? And by that I mean, oh, I don't know, doubling the lifespan, for example, of a human being, or uh, tripling it, or some gigantic uh, a step in the lifespan business here. You know, we we need to have a, uh, a historic view of of, of man, uh, which which really none of us have because we we're so much exposed to here and now, thanks to the media uh, that surrounds us which is good in some ways and perhaps not so good in others, uh, realize that if you subscribe to the fossil record, man in one form or another uh, has walked this planet for 3.1, 3.2 million years, yes? Some of the audience said yes. Some said no, just about 13,000 years. But Okay. But any, anyway, you're, 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 I'll, go, I'll go with you. Uh, just, just follow me for this train of thought for a second. Yes. If you can accept... The, the the popularly held notion in this fossil record that that man in one form or another has been around for 3.2 million years. Well, for 3.1 million of those years, life expectancy for mankind was only about 20 years of age. Uh, our um, you know our our cousins the Neanderthals and cave, uh, Neanderthals and cave man and early man uh, rarely lived beyond the age of 25 or 26. As a matter of fact, the oldest bones that had been excavated from Neanderthal graveyards were um, was a woman at age 46. Okay, but they were exposed to the elements. They, oh, of they course. killed each other. They, I mean, there's a million reasons why they died early. Well, uh, uh, and all, I guess what, here's what I'm trying to ask, Doctor. I understand the great advances um, in the protection of human beings. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, a, an overall word, protection from then till now. But when we really start talking about anti-aging, uh, we're talking about, oh, I don't know, genetic research that may turn off a switch and cause cells to begin uh, no longer dying. I, I think I'm, I, we, I'm, I was told once, we begin dying when we're born. You know, that uh, at some point shortly thereafter, more cells are dying than are being generated at some point anyway. Well, we're certainly uh, catabolic by the age of 25. In okay. some cases, we're catabolic. At, you know, some cell lines are start dying, as you say, uh, uh, as soon as we're born. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying is one of the great breakthroughs is going to happen where we're going to start living prodigious lifespans of 120 and beyond. That's it. 
Uh, we're not far away. Um, maybe 20, 25 years, 35 years, uh, 50 years at the absolute outside. The American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine is, re- is, is predicting, and this prediction has been mirrored by the World Health Organization, that uh, 50% of the baby boomers who are alive and healthy today will see their 100th birthday and beyond. In the laboratory right now, it is no big deal at all to extend the healthy, uh, youthful lifespans of laboratory animals with simple interventions, as simple as antioxidant supplements or vitamin supplements, yes. by as much as 30%, which would equate to a life expectancy for people of about 120 to 160 years. Tell us about telomeres. Well, telomeres are the end caps of uh, DNA. And uh, telomeres uh, are exciting areas of research because they appear to be one of several um, clocks within the body that wind down as we get older and inhibit the cells from reproducing themselves. And what we're finding is is that uh, these telomeres um, are immortalized in cancer cells, and that's why cancers don't stop growing. They just keep on going and going and going until they finally eat us alive. Yeah, they're actually the exception to the rule. They're out of control growth of, of cells, right? Exactly. Double, 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 again, double, again, double, again. They don't know when to quit. They don't huh? know when to quit. Uh, but our cells, in an in a undiseased human being, they know when to quit. They're told when that's to quit. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. The, uh, but the cancer cells have lost the ability to control their, uh, uh, their growth. And one of the uh, controls that is lost, there are several control mechanisms, uh, but one of them is uh, that cancer cells produce telomerase, which is an enzyme that keeps these telomeres uh, growing and growing and growing so they don't stop the process of cellular growth. Now, there are some other cells within the body that produce telomerase. Sperm cells are, are, are some. Uh, uh, some other some other cells of the uh, gut are immortalized, uh, but most of our cells have a finite amount of, of 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 this telomere that, as it shortens and shortens and shortens, it stops the growth, uh, it it stops the ability of cells to reproduce. However, as exciting as that is, and as interesting as that is, nobody has died yet because they ran out of telomeres. So it's a complex thing, no doubt. Uh, we're in the middle of unraveling the human genome. I think they're due to be done with it, I don't know, in the next few years. or uh, 2001. They 2001, originally there you planned are. on 2003, but they're way ahead of schedule. So they're going to unravel the human genome. They will then be able to diagnose much disease and much behavior and all sorts of things about us. Well, it's going to be Gattaca. That's absolutely for sure. Gattaca. Everything that was in that movie will come to pass. But then when they take the next step, and they begin to be able to manipulate that which they now understand, then then all kinds of things uh, would begin to be possible. Ordering your body, for example, to grow a new limb? Yes. A new liver? Yes. You could actually order your body to change your eye color, if you like, or your hair color, or your facial features. Um. If this discovery was made and implemented before those of us in our 50s now uh, finally die, what about even the far out possibility of ordering our bodies to get younger? Not far out at all, Art. There are at least five technologies that are on the horizon right now, some of them closer than others. Yes any one of which could lead to virtual human immortality. What are they? Well, you mentioned the Human Genome Project. Yes. It's interesting. A team of Italian scientists uh, just reported that by changing just one gene, by repositioning just one gene, this was in Nature, November 18, Yes. Uh, that uh, they could uh, uh, change the oxidative stress, the ability of the, of the cells to deal with oxidative products, which is one of the reasons why we take vitamins to fight oxidation. Right. And in laboratory mice, extend their maximum lifespan by 30% with just the a change of one gene. This is incredibly exciting because we thought in medicine uh, and, it's, and the science of aging, we thought that aging was an incredibly complex problem and it was going to require massive changes within 
uh, the cells of our body. It may turn out that aging is controlled by just a few or just a handful of genes, and if that's the case, genetic engineering may very well be one of the technologies that leads to virtual human immortality. Uh, doctor, would all of us, uh, would, would, would we collectively receive a totality of benefits, or would we have a body that's young and a brain that's aging? I mean, now uh, human beings tend toward uh, mental difficulties um, in their 70s and 80s. I think the numbers for uh, Alzheimer's begin to rise uh, dramatically at about that age. So, in other words, would those changes affect the brain as well? Hold on to that answer. Um, we're at the bottom of the hour. All right, once again, as we set this up, back briefly to Dr. Klatz. Doctor, uh, so that I if the rest of anti-aging and any of these areas that you've just spoken about should uh, get lucky, in effect, and uh, as the human genome product, uh, the process goes on, uh, unraveling it, that is. Uh, it's, it's suddenly happening faster than we thought it would. If the rest of it happens faster, then there is at least a slim chance that people of my age or younger, uh, or even a little older, might in their lifetimes have an opportunity to begin to roll it back. Is that is that... That's absolutely correct, Art. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there's every reason to believe. I, I don't even think... I don't even think you have to get very lucky. I think that you just have to be able to hang out for another 30 years or so, 35 years, uh, in reasonably good health. And the technology is advancing at such a rapid rate. Realize that biomedical knowledge is increasing at a rate. It's doubling every 3.5 years. That means that in 20 years we're going to know 64 times more about how and why we age and right. how not to. In 23 and a half years, we're going to know 128 times more. You know, and a lot of people think that doctors like yourself uh, think of themselves as gods. Do you? No. No, no. God's much better than we are. We, I know too many doctors, let me tell you that. They're not, they're, they're <laughs> we're not as bright as we'd like to think we are. And unfortunately, most of us know that that's, that's quite the case. Uh, the, most of us are pretty humble about what we do. Um, but... The exciting, the, the most exciting thing in medicine right now is not HMO medicine, is not uh, all the problems with malpractice and how, um, you know, the legal profession has, uh, has in my, at least in my humble opinion, you know, ruined uh, the, the, the profession of medicine. Uh, the exciting thing is the future of medicine, which is anti-aging, which is the biomedical revolution, which is the potential for a cure for almost all degenerative diseases that uh, we live with and we um, they're, they're so prevalent that we think of them as natural when in fact Dying they are it. not natural by the way those five um, those five home runs that I, that I talked about earlier that you know we didn't quite get to those yes, five different yes, ways yes. and one of which could you know achieve immortality yes is genetic engineering nanotechnology stem cell transplants or micro cell transplants Hormone replacement therapy and advanced growth factor cellular repair. What, what, wait a minute. Stop. I'm sorry. What stem cell? Okay, stem cells are the progenitor cells of our body. They're the early cells that create the heart tissue, that create the, 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 the nerve tissue, that create the GI tissue. Are they, are they the cells that are located at the top of the spine, near the brain? Uh, well, during the uh, during the gen during in the fetus, it is. Okay. They're 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 rep they, It's it's the early fetal cells that go on to create these organs. Those are what stem cells are. Okay. And what we just found out, which is incredibly exciting, is is that you see we thought these stem cells just disappeared as we got older. Right. And they were gone. You know, after right. you were a fetus or after you were a very young child, there were no more stem cells around. They to, did their job and psh yeah, gone. And and so you have the number of cells you have, and that's the end of it. Uh, you know, just like they said, they, they they taught us in medical school that you're born with so many brain cells and you lose 10,000 or to 100,000 brain cells a day for the rest of your life until eventually you're a blithering idiot. I think I can feel mine going by the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out the really good news is is that we found that there are, in fact, stem cells for these different organ systems lurking around inside the organs, waiting there to be reactivated and waiting to reproduce that organ and to repair that organ. And 
and even stem cells for neural tissue, that the brain doesn't stop remodeling itself. The brain doesn't stop regrowing after a certain age. It grows throughout life, and it can repair itself throughout life. It doesn't repair itself nearly as well after the age of eight as it did before the age of eight, but with new forms of stimulation, new drug therapies. Um, but other... I guess what I was asking earlier about the brain at the bottom of the hour when we were going into it, I said, would, would with the technology you imagine, would the brain uh, keep up with the rest of the body's uh, parts? With the technology that we are uh, experimenting with right now, yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we're in the process right now in human beings of doing brain transplants. Brain transplants. Micro cell brain transplants. A little, you know, just a few hundred or a few thousand or a few million cells at a time, not a whole brain. Uh, though there is a Dr. White from Case Western University yes. who has talked about that. I think you've interviewed him. Uh, no, I want to. Oh, oh Dr. White, I, I did, in fact, interview Dr. White, of course. Uh, he did the uh, monkey brain transplants. Absolutely. He is a member of the Academy of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. He lectured for us about three years ago. Fantastic lecture. He wants to do this in humans because I know. That, that is another technology. That you combine... Brain transplant with cloning technology, I know. which is the fifth, uh, the fifth on my list, and you're talking about real-time virtual immortality, and we could do it almost today. As a matter of fact, we could do it today. We could do it. I, I had a feeling. All right. Um, Dr. Vernon Howard. Yes. Um, every time I've had Dr. Klatz on, yes. we get to the point that we have just now reached, and then a million questions are begged. Yes. Immediately. Uh, number one, I guess, should we do this? Um, is, is it a wise thing for humanity to, mm -hmm. to even in, endeavor to do this? Mm -hmm. So what do you say to that, is it? Well, uh, you uh, uh, raise the uh, crucial moral question. And already the economic, social, political implications of a grain population are being hotly debated among uh, demographers and other social scientists. Um, uh, whether or not we shall ever defeat death, uh, I think that point is moot. Uh, I, I cannot speak from a clinical point of view, but um, uh, I, I defer to Dr. Klatz on that. However, I think it's important to note that extended longevity as a goal espoused by medical scientists refers not to mere long life, but to long vigorous life in full possession of one's faculties and powers. Yes. And so that uh, addresses the question that you raised. In effect, you know, will we be producing a generation of, of young fogies? <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> but even if the answer, even if the answer to that is no, which yes. it apparently is, mm -hmm. then it, there's still a, a moral question based on all kinds of sudden realities. That oh yes, oh yes. I mean, um, let's just assume, for for the sake of argument here, that we're not talking about uh, immortality, but uh, 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 the conditions which uh, Dr. Klotz referred to earlier of protracted life up to about 100, 120, 150 years. All right. Well, oh, all right. Accordingly, we can also expect, that, uh, I would say, the successive phases of life, youth, middle and old age, to be greatly protracted. And each of, uh, phase carries a different perspective, different rewards and responsibilities, and different opportunities, uh, thus posing very challenging uh, psychological and ethical problems for the individual and society. Now, to mention only a few, uh, uh, given the uh, greatly extended lifespan, to what tasks or causes shall we devote ourselves over a vastly longer lifespan? What about this notion of uh, full adult participation in society between the intervals of uh, the chronological interval of age 21 to 65? That's got to go. <laughs> Sure. I mean, uh, 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 um, what adjustments in our commitments and ambitions will we have to make? What will become of our marriages, our friendships, and professional relationships? Bank, bank accounts. How will we accommodate to accelerating social changes and inevitable stresses attending those? Social security. Social security and uh, uh, retirement. How will we cope with intergenerational tensions? How will the AMA handle the loss? Exactly. And, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, underlying uh, a good deal of what Dr. Klatz is saying, and, and, uh, and I, I fully agree with him in this, is a revolution in, oh, yes. in medical science, namely uh, 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 a redressing of the unbalance as between the emphasis on cure and prevention. 
as I think Dr. Klatt says somewhere, uh, anti-aging medicine is an outgrowth of preventive medicine and sports medicine. It, but, it's, it's, it's the next step up. But it's also a social revolution in every way you can imagine. Exactly. And, and, and I can tell you from personal experience, uh, uh, as a university teacher on, on, uh, in, in, what, four countries, um, that our higher education system is not prepared uh, to meet this new challenge. And, you know, aside from all the things we've just mentioned, it, it, in other words, as credentialing institutions, what's it going to be like when you have someone who is 65 years old and is looking to pick up a PhD and become a, a professor of Romance languages after a, a, a career in accountancy? Well, I, I see here that you co-founded and co-directed Harvard's Philosophy of Education Research Center in 1983. It also says, yes. it also says that you talk to graduates on life after college. I mean, wouldn't that change your speech? Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, but, I, uh, but by the time I wrote that book, I'd already become associated with uh, 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 A4M. And so I wrote that book with something of the uh, loom of a longer lifetime in mind, uh, suggesting to graduates that they will have to think of renewing themselves. Uh, not only does the marketplace nowadays demand this, but an uh, the, the dim prospects of conventional retirement and extended lifespan require them to reflect on the possibility of uh, two and three careers and constantly renewing themselves. And, yes, but, Doctor, our yeah. entire society now demands that we die. I mean, exactly. it, it, it's set up that way. Insurance companies, what would become of them? Everything you could talk about, everything exactly. you could imagine would change. Can we really... Are we really prepared in the kind of time that Dr. Klatz is talking about to go through this kind of change? It's unimaginable. Art, I think that is, is, is precisely the question to ask. And, I, and, and in my own opinion, the answer is no. We are not prepared, and uh, that's why we're having this conversation. Let me just add this. I think ageism is perhaps the last casual prejudice. Mm. Rampant in the workplace and far beyond. And our society's preconceptions of age aging are shaped by centuries of hardship, disease, and resignation to relative, well, let's call it short jeopardy, mm -hmm. and the religious, artistic, and cultural expressions engendered by that condition. So as a consequence, we have inherited a legacy of ageism in our personal lives, in corporate life, in education, in the media, and the popular press that must change if uh, uh, future longer-lived generations are to reach their full potential as responsible and productive citizens in a democratic society. No, we're not ready for that. All right. When you hear that, Dr. Klatz, knowing the way the science is moving right now, and I know that you know the way it's moving, what do you say? I say that Dr. Vernon Howard is absolutely correct. Um, you know, I think what's really exciting, I, uh, two things I think are very interesting I'd like to mention right now. Anti-aging medicine is serendipity. It's a gift. It was not planned for. It was not supported. The National Institute of Aging, which has a $625 million budget to explore the issues of aging and aging-related disease, by their own admission, spends about a million dollars or less on clinical anti-aging research. Uh, the advances that we're talking about have come out of collateral fields, they were not planned for. They just kind of spun off of other technologies, research in cancer, diabetes, heart disease, uh, genetic engineering, uh, uh, molecular biology. And we're having, we're sitting on the cusp of a new age that's looming before us, the, the ageless society, and it's happening in spite of the efforts of government and industry, not because of. Imagine how much faster it would go <laughs> if we were to redirect some of our financial efforts. Well, even faster is the answer. And if you list, I just listened to Dr. Howard, and really, shouldn't you be slowing down? No, I don't think so, because the benefits of the Ageless Society are so incredible. I mean, look, I'm a doctor, Art, and I, I, I'm pledged to help save life and to fight disease. And, and to prevent, you know, degeneration. 
Uh, and I think that anti-aging is a, a, a great thing. I mean, I don't like to, you know, Alzheimer's disease bothers me personally. There are Parkinson's six... disease doesn't look too good in my eyes. No, of course not. <laughs> there, but there are six billion people on the planet right now, Dr. Platts. You put your finger on it. And if, um, do you, first answer this for me. Do you honestly believe the world's population is prepared with a, a, a longer lifespan, significantly lo longer lifespan, to stop reproducing at present rates? Mm, that's a good question. I am not sure, but I'll tell you what has happened in first world countries. Well, you better be sure before you start handing out the pills. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just hope that it, that it is up to me who gets the pills, Art. Well, that's a whole that's, that's another, separate discussion. That's another argument altogether. Yeah. Uh, but what has happened in the first world countries that... Uh, you know, the, the, the population growth is not a problem in the first world countries. The U.S., uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Britain, uh, Scandinavia, the first world nations have zero population growth, actually have negative population growth. I believe the reproductive rate in Italy right now is like 1.4 per couple. In the U.S., it's something like 1.8 per couple. Yeah, that's for natives. But we have a positive population growth because of immigration. That's because of all those other countries I was talking about. Exactly. It's the third world nations. And the reason why there's such an incredible amount of growth in the population of third world countries is in the first world, the less children you have, the better the quality of life you enjoy. Right. You have more money, you have better access to education, to health care, right. et etc. Et right. So smaller families mean higher quality of life. In the third world, it's just the opposite. The more children you have, the, the better chance you have of being taken care of when you grow old. Right. The more there, uh, hands there are to, to, to work the fields or to work the, the streets and to raise money for the family. Absolutely. So as... Anti-aging medicine, the technology of anti-aging medicine, filters down from the first world to the third world countries, and the quality of life starts to increase as it is doing in many places. I predict that we're going to see a reduction, a vast reduction in reproduction. Yeah, also, yeah, well, well, maybe so, but uh, Dr. Howard, if uh, Dr. Klatz had the pills right now, uh, yeah. Would you recommend to him that he evenly distribute those pills to everywhere, including India and Bangladesh and, you know, where, wherever? Well, I think even prior to that is uh, the, the uh, question of um, access to the medical technologies. Oh, yes. Uh, it, it, in other words, who can pay for this? Who will pay for it? Almost anybody. <laughs> uh, who's got the money? Who's got the money? But what about those who don't? Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that is a serious uh, ethical social problem. And, a uh, very serious one. Yeah. A, a very, very serious, serious one. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think mean, this is great. Uh, I, I, I don't have answers to these uh, questions, but uh, I, I am in the business of, 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 of raising them. <laughs> and um, I, I see the issue of um, access uh, uh, as, as, as a particularly uh, pressing ethical issue. In uh, some states, they have, uh, for terminal patients, they have almost a triage mm -hmm. kind of system, and committees of doctors and others will decide at times when plugs are pulled and uh, procedures are not done because of the progression of disease or whatever. Mm -hmm. Will there be similar committees at some point, maybe even very early on, who would decide where the benefits of anti-aging uh, would be applied first? That seems likely, because if, if the technology drives the, uh, uh, the uh, need, then um, uh, some decisions will have to, have to be made. Now, just how they will be made, I, I can't possibly know. Uh, but um, uh, that such decisions will be made seems almost uh, certain. Mandatory. I mean, Mandatory. If, if it, was... it, it will be forced upon us. Well, Art, I disagree. You do. Good. Good. I, okay. I disagree with it. You know, I hate to disagree with Dr. Howard because I have such great respect No, let's him. rock. Come on. <laughs> uh, but I have to disagree with this. Now, right. you know, what Dr. Howard hasn't told you and what we haven't brought up, and I think it's really important, and this is, by the way, this is a historic show, Art. Again, you're at the, at the very cutting edge 
of technology and of social issues. This is a the issue uh, of the ageless society and anti-aging medicine has not been addressed by the media. Period. This is the first time in the history of the world, by the way, I must say, because you know I'm I'm the guy who came up who coined the term anti-aging medicine, and so I'm often sought out by the media when they when they go to discuss these issues. Well, most of the media is spineless, Doctor. Yes. That, that's why you're here. And I, I'm glad you have quite a strong backbone, Art. I, I think you're doing a service to humanity and, and certainly to your listeners, and I, I commend you for that. But Dr. Howard uh, is uh, at Tufts University, and uh, he can tell you more about his uh, credentials there, but Tufts is taking a very, um, is taking a very bold step uh, and creating a dialogue uh, to look at the social implications of anti-aging and the ageless society in a number of symposia that will be held over the next several years, which Dr. Vernon Howard will be uh, chairing. All right, listen, the two of you have a point of disagreement. We're at the top of the hour. Both of you hold on. We'll come back and find out exactly what that really is. All right, once again, Dr. Ronald Klatz and Dr. Vernon Howard. And, um, it, you know, it really helps us all when uh, academics like these disagree. We learn from it. You guys are like senators, though, the honorable so-and-so, and and then there's got to be about five or six paragraphs of praise before you get to the point of disagreement. You're both um, at the top of your fields, uh, and there is a disagreement here, uh, Dr. Klatz. Uh, Where is it? Well, you know, you got to you got to realize, uh, Art, that uh, Vernon's a per, uh, you know is a pretty uh, is a pretty accomplished athlete and uh, a strong fellow and uh, kind of spooky. I wouldn't want to run into him on dark alleys. So I have to be nice to him. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, uh, you know, it, it, it's very um, seductive. It's a seductive argument to talk about how dark and how bleak and how miserable this is. You know, all this. You know, good stuff about anti-aging medicine is going to be. You know, let's let's take this win-win-win-win-win scenario of anti-aging medicine: a, a bright future with no disease, no no illness, uh, very little death uh, except for you know perhaps trauma or accident. Uh, you know, and turn it around and say, oh, it's going to be so horrible. We're going to overpopulate the planet with all these elder cockers who uh, you know uh, are drooling on their shoes or you know taking up uh, breathing too much air for those uh, new young people to uh, get along and. Uh, frankly, uh, those of us at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, or at least, well, Vernon's at the Academy as well, but those of us who are, you know, the, the clinicians at least don't see it that way. Uh, we see a different um, uh, reality. We see, um, we see, the, with the creation of the Ageless Society, that there w- that this Ageless Society will be generating boundless amounts of wealth, and uh, that's a very bright rather than a dark one, and I say this because for every year that you can extend the healthy, productive lifespan of the American public, you increase the gross national product from anywhere from two to five trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollars. So if we could only increase the healthy, productive lifespan of the American public by, say, four years, we're talking about a minimum. We're talking about the creation of a minimum of an additional eight trillion dollars. That's enough to pay off the national debt, to pay off uh, health care in the United States, and have money left over to send uh, almost every young American to college for free. Realize that people generate. The vast majority of their savings for retirement in the last 10 years of their life, that's when they're the most productive and that's when they generate the most wealth. Right. Well, if you could extend those last few highly productive years, if you could double them, then you're saying, then what we're saying is, is that people could double their savings, could double their income, could not income, sure. Their, their, sure. Their, their life income. The, you know, the total amount of dollars they have left to live on forever. And uh, by a very simple equation, and, and this is in my book, Ten Weeks to a Younger You. I don't know if you have my book or not, my new one. I, but, I, I uh, do. I have an autographed copy, actually. Oh, good. 
Okay. Well, um, in, in 10 Weeks Too Young Are You, uh, I talk about a very simple equation by which if, uh, if anyone can do this, anyone who has 30 years and who can save uh, roughly $2,000 a year with simple compounding interest will become a millionaire within 30 years. Right. Um, you're absolutely right. But um, not everybody, as we all know, is responsible that way. That's why we have this social security system. True. Because people, most people end up at, uh, what, 65 years of age with nothing but. Right. I mean, that's the reality versus... Well, I, I, I understand that, Art, but I'm just saying that it doesn't have to be the reality any more than the population explosion has to be the reality. These are social and political issues. We have the technology to stop the population explosion today if the oh, government sure. of this world... Uh, and, the, uh, and, and the political powers of this world were to desire it. Well, with proper uh, education, with people having a long-term plan. You know, when I was growing up, I'm sure as when you were growing up, um, you know, people were old by age 30. And there was a, a common saying, don't trust anyone over 30. This was during the time of Vietnam. I said it. Okay, because people were old at that age. Well, today people, heck, I know people who are 60 who are younger than I am, at least, you know, mentally and emotionally. Uh, the point is, is that if people ha ha grow up in a world where they expect 100 years of youth, their philosophies and their way of living will change drastically, and we're seeing that already with, in the last 20 years with the uh, Green Revolution, with the, uh, you know, all the political pressures against pollution and, and saving the environment, et cetera, et cetera, because people, as they get to a certain age in life, they become more philosophical, and they look at the world as, uh, as an integrated whole rather than simply... Uh, you know, as a, as a young child will, that the world ends at the end of his fingertips. But you're you're, you're describing uh, describing a very idyllic world yes. that that is not here right now. And I'm not saying we can't get to it, but we sure aren't there now. And uh, and for the foreseeable future, our environment right now, Doctor, uh, versus the Greens who are trying to help it, is going downhill fast. Well, I, I I have a hard time arguing that point with you, Art. Okay, let me just make another argument then, and I, and and I'll turn the the, the, the podium over to, uh, to Dr. Howard if he has any other comment. And, and that is this. We have two choices right now. Uh, we can choose to embrace the notion of the ageless society by supporting anti-aging clinical research and by supporting the biotechnology that's in the laboratories right now and helping to encourage that and cure these horrible diseases of old age, which I believe are, in fact, curable, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's right. disease, diabetes, heart disease, right. and many forms, if not all forms, of cancer. Okay, we can embrace it and we can go for it. Or we can say, oh, no, 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 anti-aging medicine, we're not ready for that. The world's a horrible place. We want to keep it a horrible place another few years more. Uh, let's take all this technology and lock it up in the back room, and let's just let things go the way they are today. Well, the way they are today, when you reach a certain age, about age 60, uh, or about age 60-ish, you start developing these degenerative diseases of aging. Sure. And so the last 10 years of your life or 15 years of your life are not the golden age. They're really the um, uh, the geriatric age where you're taking uh, about nine different prescription medications uh, each year uh, to take care of your arthritis and your degenerative diseases of aging. And we as a nation... Under that scenario, we'll become a nation of nursing homes by the year 2025 because the baby boomers are retiring in mass uh, come uh, the year 2011. And by the year 2025, there'll be two 65-year-olds for every young teenager in America. And, so, and forget about America being a superpower because we'll be a geriatric power. <laughs> we have two choices. We either change aging as we know it, and we have the technology to do it. It's called anti-aging medicine. Or we embrace geriatric medicine and we start building nursing homes at a prodigious rate like the Manhattan Project because God only knows that we're going to need them. Okay. Um, you make people who consider the ethical uh, ramifications and the moral uh, ramifications of this sound like the bad guys. Well, but there are I'm not some, trying to. Uh, there, yeah. are, there are really some very serious questions. Dr. Howard. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't think Dr. Klatz is 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 doing that at all. 
uh, ours is a, a you know an honorable disagreement here. Uh, the vision that he sets out is indeed, I think, a positive and idealistic one. Sure. Uh, as the uh, as I recall, if I have the logic of this correct, Art, uh, uh, our disagreement dropped out of your question to me about uh, triage like the uh, inevitability or necessity of triage like uh, decisions being made about access to uh, anti-aging medicine be on, one the, of the... on the presumption of, of inequities, sure. uh, you, you know, uh, um, uh, inequalities in access to the, uh, these clinical procedures of one kind or other. Now, behind that lurks, and I think Ron did touch upon this, and, and, and just as he touched upon it, he backed away from it, and I think he backed away from it quite rightly. Uh, namely, will the uh, social institutions, the political structures, uh, social attitudes, keep up with the technology? Can it catch up with the technology? Uh, he's recommending that it should. I would love to see that it would, uh, but I remain more skeptical uh, uh, in that domain. As do uh, I. I. As uh, do I. I, mean, uh, it, it... I, I. I do believe the technology is driving us in that direction, but whether the social structures, the political structures, the uh, attitudes, cultural attitudes, uh, and other resistances, ageism and, and the like, whether these... Um, Elements, the cultural elements will change in time to bring about equitable conditions. I just don't know. It's and just, I don't think Dr. Klotz knows either, but he hopes they will, and I just remain a bit skeptical. Dr. There. Howard, I, I think rightfully so, it, it, at least um, by today's standards. If you are in Central Africa right now and yes. you get AIDS, you are going to die. Mm -hmm. If you're in America and you get AIDS, there is every possibility you'll live a fairly long life with the advances Quite. they've made. Quite. Uh, so the guy in Africa, he dies because he doesn't have the money, he doesn't have the technology, he doesn't have anything. So he's going to die. I think what th this exchange illustrates, and, I, and I'm sure Dr. Klotz would, would, would agree with this, is the urgency of these issues. Uh, yes. Is, uh, is not only the clinical ones, and, and they are remarkable. They're just to listen to him talk about them uh, uh, leaves me... Uh, every time I hear this, my, my jaw drops. Huh. But at the same time, uh, I, I'm alerted to so many of the ethical, psychological, social problems of the kind that uh, we've just uh, touched upon here. Well, he's not going to stop. Dr. Klatz isn't going to stop, and I wouldn't want him to. Nor should he. Nor should he. But, boy, it sure is going to be a race. It certainly is going to uh, cause an upheaval in, in many domains. Would you, for example, uh, Dr. Howard... Yes. With the first availability of this technology, mm -hmm. uh, see to it that it's given to people who do positive things for society first. Uh, the Einsteins, the political leaders of great strength and vision, the poets, the... Uh, I, I don't know. You get the idea. Yeah, I get the idea, and uh, uh, I think it's an idea that uh, many uh, democratic societies would uh, find repulsive. Uh, and yet there are others, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, if it were a question of uh, the survival of the race, might uh, uh, very well opt for something like that. But um, uh, uh, that is yet another one of those ethical issues, uh, um, uh, 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 which um, touches on questions of elitism. Yes. So, uh, and uh, if you go from there, well, what about uh, uh, racial preferences or gender preferences or uh, whatnot? I mean, uh, 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 when you base access upon uh, uh, a hierarchy of talent or a hierarchy of class or race or uh, political persuasion, where does it stop? Uh, Dr. Klatz, where does it stop? Well, I, I, think it, I think it stops by not starting. Right. Let's, let's, let's look at this another way. You know, you know, aging and immortality, or, you know, and realize when I say immortality, I'm talking practical immortality, lifespans of 150, 200. I'm yeah, not talking about lifespans right. of everlasting, of 10,000 and beyond. So let, let me be clear about that before All right. I my colleagues in the medical profession have me strung up. <laughs> okay, but um, let's let, let's bring this down to earth for a second. 
let's change the conversation from practical immortality or longevity or ex extreme longevity to cancer. How about if company XYZ was to announce tomorrow that they had found the ultimate cure to cancer and it came in a pill and the pill cost practically nothing to produce, maybe a tenth of a cent a pill, and you only had to take one of them and you were absolutely immunized from ca for cancer for the rest of your life. Well, no matter how long that would be. You live in a really idyllic world. If there was such a pill, doctor, I don't for one second think that it would cost practically nothing. They would absolutely figure out a way to have that pill well, I'm be sure that would very, be. very expensive. I, I, I agree with you as a matter of politics and, and uh, reality. And experience, but I'm just trying, for the sake of this argument, let's not talk about immortality for a second. Let's talk about cancer. Who would uh, tolerate? Who would tolerate? Have, having the knowledge that there was a company that had the cure for cancer and they were not going to release it to everyone. They were only going to give it to their friends and to the guys in Washington and their, and their, and their buddies at the FDA. But uh, the rest of us poor mortals uh, would have to suffer because, you know, if we eliminate cancer, there might be a population explosion. Uh, there certainly would be a, 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 a ding in the bank account of, uh, of uh, the uh, powers that, uh, you know, live off the cancer industry. Uh, at the very least, and, and that would be a, what, a multi-billion dollar hit. Yes, it would. But you see, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's inconceivable, or at least I hope it's inconceivable, uh, to you that a company could withhold the cure for cancer, but... You know, in the same breath, we're, we're talking about withholding the cure to not just cancer, but heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, et cetera. It's a hundred times more pernicious to withhold the cure to aging, because aging's a disease, just as cancer is a disease. I guess we have to get used to thinking of it that way, because I don't right now. No, no, no. Cancer is a do. disease, heart disease, I understand that, the diseases of the brain. But aging, I've never thought of as a disease. I've thought of it as an inevitability, uh, something that, you know, uh, ashes to ashes. I mean, it's meant to be. And, and I oh, guess. Oh, you just said the magic words, Art. It's meant to be. <laughs> well, as long as aging is meant to be, we're never going to find a cure for it. It wasn't until polio was not meant to be that, uh, you know, uh, the medical profession was free to You're actually right. look for new ways of treating the disorder. You're right, of course. All right, hold on, please, uh, doctors. We'll be right back. Well, all right, we are discussing aging and really a lot more. And we're doing it with uh, Dr. Ronald Klatz, who is probably the world's expert in this area of medicine, as well as Dr. Vernon Howard, who is obviously an expert, expert in, the, in, in the social uh, consequences, discussing the ethical and social consequences of such a, a gigantic revolution. It would indeed be a gigantic revolution. Dr. Klatz is president and founder of the Anti-Aging uh, uh, Academy. Uh, the Academy of actually anti-aging is the way I think it's put, and I, I, I believe there is an offer on the table, uh, Dr. Klatz. Uh, they can phone your uh, anti-aging uh, medicine center, the American Academy of Anti-Aging, and they can get something sent to them. What? Yeah, we have uh, we've got a great deal for your listeners, Art. I, I always enjoy doing your show, and. Uh... Oh, uh, we're at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine here in Chicago. I have an 800 line set up, and there's, uh, I think there's five incoming lines, so hopefully they won't be busy, or if they are, you'll, you can just call back. But They're going to be locked up. Oh, uh, well, okay, then that's great, because we want to get this information out. You see, we're a non-profit medical society, and uh, our job is to get this information out to the public, to let the public know what can be done uh, to slow... Uh, to uh, for the early detection, the prevention, uh, the slowing, and perhaps even the reversal of the aging process. Right. And so if your listeners call this number, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine in Chicago at 
It's an 800 number. We'll send them a package of information. It's worth about $25 if they were to buy the material inf uh, individually. And it includes um, uh, our magazines. It includes newsletters from the Academy. We have uh, a yearbook of, uh, of activities of the Academy. It lists doctors who are practicing this medicine, clinics that are, are providing this medicine, and even a physician's desk reference in, in this package. Um, you know, which lists all the different drugs and the nutrients and the therapies that are available that have anti-aging effects. Right. Now, I only have enough packages for the first uh, probably 1,000 callers, okay, 500 to 1,000. I know there's at least 500. I think there may be enough for 1,000 callers. So you should give that number a call. What are you charging? We're charging nothing. You're charging nothing. No, it's 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 you art, and and for your people, <laughs> the price is right. The price is zero. Yeah, the price is right. Uh, you, um, <laughs> uh, now, you better get ready. If there's anyone out there who would like to help the academy, you know, we're in Chicago and we're looking for donations. We're a 501c3. We're a nonprofit, and uh, to do this sort of thing does take money. But uh, uh, you know, so if there's any you know benevolent sorts out there, Howard Hughes types especially, who would like to advance the science, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but oh, I, oh I, that brings up kind of an interesting ethical question for you, Doctor. Let's say I was a Howard Hughes type. Well, I think you are a Howard Hughes type. No, I'm not. A billion. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, let's say I had billions of dollars, and I don't. Okay. And let's say I came to you privately and sat down in front of your desk, and I said, Look, Doctor, I've got all the money you're ever going to need for the research you're doing, but I want you to keep me alive... Uh, for at least 150 years. I want you to do everything in your power to do that, and here's $3 billion or $10 billion. Done deal, Art. <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for Bill Gates to call me any day. I've, I've been waiting for the last 10 years. Frankly, I don't understand why he hasn't, because, Frank, you know, I mean, what is there in life, Art, after you have money handled? Well, I'm not sure that he hasn't. He, he hasn't looked to me like he's been aging I mean, lately. He, doesn't look, that, he look... doesn't look that great to me, Art, and I, I have a very <laughs> well-trained eye in this affair. <laughs> I think Bill Gates needs my help more than he realizes. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, well, uh, you're going to need Bill Gates' help on making an offer like that. <laughs> Are those... Um, are those? Is that a 24-hour number, or is it during the day? No, it's 24 hours. <laughs> or they could go to our website. If they don't even want to make the telephone call, we have yes. a website that has thousands of pages of free information, and it's worldhealth.net. That's World Health, one word, like the World Health Organization, right. dot net. I'm sure we've got a link up. I'm sure we do. As a matter of fact, last time I was on the show and we connected to you, it was incredible. We just uh, uh -huh. got so much traffic through our website. I can imagine. And the important thing that I'd like to just w say one last thing, commercial, it's not very commercial because we're not commercial, we're a nonprofit, but what I'd really like the listeners to do is I'd like them to join the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. We're a society that's open to the general public. Uh, our goal is to make the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine the next American Heart Association because if we have enough enough members of the general public, we will be able to redirect the focus of research uh, in Washington. The, 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 the $15 billion or so that are spent uh, on medical research, uh, on scientific research, and directed towards things that count, that, that will count within our lifespan. I mean, it's, you know, research on the snail darter and on, you know, uh, you know these, these kind of interesting but uh, not necessarily uh, critical uh, issues are important, but realize the government is only spending one million dollars or less on clinical anti-aging medical research. Did you hear the little song I played coming into this short people? That's right. All right, the rice of uh, short people. Uh, well, it, th it, there it, will it, come a time with the work that you're doing when designer children will absolutely be possible. It may even come before the uh, the big uh, breakthrough in anti-aging. It's, it's already here, Art. There already are no here. more short people, or very few short people. Uh, human growth hormone over the last 30 years has virtually eliminated uh, dwarfism and uh, uh, midgetism. As a matter of fact, it would, you'd be hard-pressed to cast for the Wizard of Oz today because there are no more munchkins. <laughs> Well, but it's, it. going, mean, it's going to go, though, beyond that. It's going to go to ordering eye color. It's going to go to ordering uh, intellectual level. Uh, if ultimately, it's going to go to true 
design our children. And, uh, Dr. Howard, are we ready for that one? Well, certainly uh, many of the established religions are not. And uh, 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 once again, uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, it's a question of uh, how quickly social institutions can catch up. And um, there is ingrained in much popular thinking about such matters um, the distinction between what is natural and what is unnatural. Um, uh, th th this issue comes up uh, time and again in discussions of contraception and the like and uh, in vitro fertilization. Um, and uh, I, I think many religious sensibilities will be highly stressed by these prospects. I, I'm not saying one way or the other uh, whether they're right or wrong, but uh, I think... You're just stating a fact. Yes, I'm stating a fact, that, that, that there will be considerable social distress over these matters, uh, and as well as the other matters that we have discussed, and that they have to be dealt with, at least uh, 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 investigated, uh, to... It's to diminish the the uh, amount of uh, social stress and chaos that may result. Dr. Klatz, how frequently, as you plunge forth in your research, do you stop and think about things like this? Well, not very often, Art. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not stopping the research. When, when you have, I know that you have panels of doctors and you have meetings and seminars on this very thing, and you have people like Dr. Howard there. Yes, when, you, when you all get going, what turns out to be the center of attention? What turns out to be the center of contention? You know, the contention is basically focused around who will have access to this technology and who will control this technology. Yes. Who gets the pills? We said it earlier. We yep. said it earlier, and I think the best synthesis of these discussions and you know it's not like we're rushing into the future with our eyes closed and you know living this Pollyanna uh, you know wish for no, the, but you may be, man. You may be squinting real hard. Well, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but you know these issues are in fact discussed. Uh, it doesn't slow us down, it doesn't stop the science, but we still talk about the philosophy and we're really concerned about it. But the best answer that I've heard so far is is that Democracy, democratization of this technology, the, you know, the, 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 the technology in the greatest number of hands is the only equitable way of proceeding. So if your we try and lock this stuff up in a closet somewhere, right. it won't stay there. So then we're you're, talking life and death. Fine, then your answer is everybody gets the pills. That would be my choice. And you, Dr. Howard, well, if, if the uh, bill were available now? Oh, sure. I, I, I certainly agree with that. It's just that I think many other people wouldn't uh, on uh, uh, religious or moral uh, or whatever grounds. Uh, they, they would probably reject it. How about just old plain practical grounds? In other words, if, if the pill was here today and it, were dis it would be distributed to Mexico, um, uh, where they, there's a, a large Catholic population and they frankly don't practice a whole lot of birth control there. Along with a lot of other uh, predominantly Catholic countries, yeah. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah, but Art, what are we going to do? We're going to say sorry. We don't like your politics. You can't live. Isn't that what we've done in, in most of our history? Well, maybe some have done. I haven't. <laughs> I mean, it, we, World War II. Somebody said to us, "We don't like politics, so you're going to have to die." Yeah. Well. I'm not arguing the point with you, Art. I mean, there, you know, if, a, if it comes down to a political choice, our political leaders may make very nasty decisions, as they have in the past. Uh, but if, you know, if I'm the guy who's in charge and has my finger on the, and it's my finger that's on the button, I'm going to let the genie out of the, out of the lamp. Now, uh, that's an interesting uh, thought. Do you think that they, in quotes, would allow you to let that genie out. That's a scary thought, Art. Mm. It's, it's a practical one. I know, and uh, you have more experience in this realm than I do, but I've heard... Well, I'm told that the guy who invented the carburetor that gets a 1,000 miles or whatever it is, he's dead. You know, he's a lump in the desert somewhere. Yeah, it, it, it is kind of scary that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the implications... So far, I haven't had a knock on the door by anyone in black suits, but I expect that'll be coming sooner than later. Yeah, so do I. And, uh, and, and I suspect that they will take you to someone who will talk to you about who gets a pill. Well, you know, that's what happened with Tesla, isn't it? 
Yes. And probably, uh, you know, every other major breakthrough that has occurred in... Uh, Bingo. Yeah. Yeah, they came in when he died, and they confiscated every scrap of everything there was, and they took it away, and we haven't seen it since. That's what happened with Tesla. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Art, I, I don't know. Um... Uh, I don't. All I can do is just do what I'm doing, and that's to keep pushing uh, the science and keep pushing society and uh, keep working towards uh, this goal of a bright future uh, and an ageless society. And I'll continue until such time as uh, as I'm stopped. Hopefully, I won't be stopped uh, very very soon. But uh, you might be right. This, you know, there might be a knock on the door one day. Dr. Howard, uh, yeah. you think of this sort of thing? Do you think that um, a government, a whatever government there would be or uh, leadership we would have at a time that such mm -hmm. an advance was made, mm -hmm. would they be able to stay out of it? I doubt that they could stay out of it. Uh, 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 I, I'm no prophet, but uh, w one of the reasons that I think it's important to discuss these issues openly is to keep the democratic process involved. Um, I mean, there are issues of citizenship and service uh, uh, involved here, which we are very much concerned with at the Lincoln Filene Center for Citizenship and Public Affairs at Tufts. And the more open you can keep this debate um, with both the clinical uh, – I mean, I, I fully agree with Dr. Klass that his role is to proceed on the scientific and the clinical, the medical side. Sure it is. And, 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 and to press ahead. I think he would fully agree with me uh, that uh, other people with other interests, sociological, ethical, uh, uh, political, uh, need to be added, um, uh, brought on board to, to consider the very issues which you've been raising as uh, uh, adjacent fields deserving of attention in order to keep the democratic process going so, so, Dr. That, uh, so that the knock will not come at the door uh, in any clandestine way. So... Uh... Dr. Klatz, when you have the seminars with other doctors like Dr. Howard and you get to this part of the discussion, does your side of the table tend to go, yeah, yeah, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's a... Not quite sure how to answer that, Art. <laughs> uh, well, that's probably because the, the answer is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it is inevitable. I know we're going to go plunging ahead. We're doing it on every front, the Internet. We live in a dot-com world right now, and you just said the anti-aging revolution will make that look like kids' uh, stuff. So, Oh, absolutely. Think about it, Art. I mean, you know, we're right on the cusp of being able to reprogram our own DNA. I mean, what can it, uh, how can uh, a computer uh, compete with that? Um. I mean, we're talking about being able to take a pill or a shot or an injection yeah. to rebuild our heart, to rebuild our brain, to expand our consciousness. We're talking about uh, uh, implants uh, of um, silicone, uh, you know, silicone uh, uh, integrated circuits that plug right into your brain that will allow you to have oh boy. not just vision, uh, but x-ray vision, so infrared vision will be able to allow you to uh, connect instantly with the internet without a computer just to think about it have you seen a commercial running on television doctor recently um I, you probably don't get to watch much but it shows some guy in a store oh yes i've seen that oh yeah and he's walking around he's, he it looks like he's stealing stuff shopping right, he's shoving it in his uh, jacket pocket he walks right out the door and the guard stops him like he's going to arrest him and says sir you forgot your receipt <laughs> well the guy had an, a chip implanted and it read it the chart debited the card and he just he, he didn't have to go to any checkout because there wasn't any checkout. That's right. As a matter of fact, that ship actually exists. It's called the Digital Angel, and that was just so... Oh, my God. Did, did they really call it that? That's exactly what they call it, and I'm trying to find uh, the reference for it. Digital in front Angel. Of me somewhere. Sounds more like a digital devil. <laughs> it there it very are, well may be. Oh, uh, that's kind of scary, frankly. And Why would somebody uh, with that sort of technology name it something they know would inflame the group that we all know we're talking about here? The digital angel? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's kind of like those government programs that are kind of like double speak, you know, well, like the uh, government program for freedom of, uh, 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 of the media that are, in fact, you know, uh, uh, programs that remove your First Amendment rights. Uh, 
So wasn't no. it Ronald Reagan who wanted to name a submarine the Corpus Christi? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so there's no, there's really no stopping it. Uh, it's there's coming. Only con- there's only controlling it, Art. There's only controlling it. You see that we're rushing headlong into the future. This is the future of medicine, and it's not far distant future. It's like tomorrow's future. The best we can hope for is to control the future. If we don't take control of it, if somebody doesn't have a vision for the way it should be, then God help us all. Mm-hmm. And even if the world was to develop according to someone's vision, you know, uh, let's talk about my vision for a second, which I think is a kind of a happy, you know, bright future. You know, even if the, you know, if the public was to embrace that vision itself, it would still be a massive undertaking to try and achieve that goal. But if we go forward with our eyes closed, hanging on with our nails to the edge of our chair, then disaster is the inevitable consequence. It's the first and time I've heard God's name tonight. Now, why not? Uh, do you believe in a God, an active God of the Bible, uh, Dr. Klatz? Oh, yes, I do. You do? I- I'm, very, uh, I- I'm rather spiritual myself. You are? Uh, do you, Not do you, terribly religious, but I, I, I categorize myself as spiritual. Do you think that you know we're getting close to his ballpark, his arena, well, playing you, in his arena? Yeah, I think that we're getting closer all the time. I'm I'm predicting, you know, I, I, why not, Art? You know, we're 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 breaking new ground every moment with this conversation. I'll give you another one of my predictions. Uh, I'm predicting that uh, uh, we will have a digital cerebral interface which will allow people to move their consciousness and their psyche uh, into cyberspace within the next 25 uh, years to 35 years. That's probably the sixth way uh, that we might achieve practical immortality. We might very well be able to become uh, gods ourselves within cyberspace. We're certainly godlike. You, you mean actually? I don't mean to say that we are gods or will be gods. I'm saying that we will have godlike powers with the advent of the digital cerebral interface through uh, uh, through cyberspace and virtual reality, um, uh, the creation of virtual realities. Oh, brother! <laughs> All right, here's what I would like to do. I would like to let the audience, if you both are up for it ask you both questions. Sure. Are you both up for that? Oh, yes. Sure. All right. Then that's what... Let them come, Art. All right. I like your idea. (laughs) Then that's what's coming next. Uh, Hold tight, both of you. I'm Art Bell, and this is Coast to Coast AM. All right. We have a lot of callers on the line uh, for Dr. Klatz and Dr. Howard, but... um, uh, Doctors, just a couple of very quick things. I'm going to read you a couple of faxes I've got, and I've got handfuls of them here. This one. Oh, come on, Art. You're familiar with the term disinformation campaign, aren't you? Uh, you know, if these guys come out with a cure for cancer that costs no more than an aspirin, here's what will happen. One, the FDA will never finish testing it on rats. They'll pump a rat full of 10 pounds of the stuff. The rat will die. Two, these guys will be labeled dangerous quacks so fast it'll make your head spin. Three. Their research, their discoveries, Too late art. <laughs> their research, their discoveries, maybe even themselves, will be buried so far into obscurity uh, that uh, tonight on your show may be the closest they'll ever come to getting their information anywhere near the public. Uh, four, my bet is the medical lobby and the drug companies uh, and their lobbies in Washington would arrange to have these guys investigated by the Justice Department, the IRS, or any number of other agencies, and if they can't stop them, you'll probably see another accidental, unfortunate, Waco-type affair. And five, immortality is in direct conflict with almost every organized religion. If the government doesn't get these guys, that church will. (laughs) Oh, well, so much for my life extension program. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, um, all of the... We gave out a phone number for this free information, and... Uh, not only are your phone lines jammed, but the entire trunk line going to your phone lines is jammed. 
Well, I'll get that straightened out in the morning, so if the listeners will bear with us, and uh, they can go to our website at uh, worldhealth.net and log in there uh, for all kinds of free information and a free newsletter, and that's an unlimited offer. Uh, but if they would go uh, to uh, that phone number, I'll get that fixed first thing in the morning. I suppose that uh, there's just uh, too much interest, which is which is a good thing. Well, it's a telling thing, isn't it? In other words, as much as we sit here and fret about the social consequences, individually offered the opportunity, people are going to take it every time, every oh, yes. every time, uh, yeah. r right, Dr. Howard? Yes, I, I, I do think so. Yes, yes, huh. it's it, it's it's self-interest. Yes, it is. Uh, it's it's how we elect presidents. Uh, you know, we check yeah. our wallet, right, and yeah. then we vote. The, right. the only catch is we would like to link it to enlightenment, so that it becomes enlightened self-interest and uh, that not mere selfishness. Um, yes. Well, all right. Then this question: How do your guests feel that religion and spirituality will be affected by the existence or the use of anti-aging technology? Will there be a backlash by the traditional mainstream religions? Uh, so will be, people become more spiritual, or would they tend to become less so? Dr. Howard, this is your... your yeah, theology. right. <laughs> this is asking me to be a prophet, not, uh, not merely a philosopher. Uh, well, uh, I, I think it will vary uh, uh, greatly um, uh, uh, from uh, one uh, religion or even subset of religion to another, um, uh, some may become uh, really quite uh, wrapped up in the uh, natural, unnatural distinction. Uh, 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 like one of the earlier questioners on, on on the issue of contraception, others may see it, as I hinted in the comment a while back, as an opportunity for increased spirituality, uh, in the sense that one needn't feel so rushed at life. One needn't feel uh, the, the kind of desperation that um, I think drives people either to fanatical extremes on the one hand or yes. to uh, grotesque extremes of materialism on the other. Yes. Um, one would have time to reflect. One would have time in particular, I think, to reflect on um, the pattern of one's or the patterns of one's own life. And um, uh, so I, I don't see in this an inherent threat to religiosity or spirituality. I do see uh, a threat, a piecemeal, as it were, vis-à-vis um, -vis certain doctrines and uh, cherished beliefs, particularly in the realm of, um, of what we would commonly call metaphysics, you know, where, mm -hmm. where you think um, uh, you can properly draw a line between what is proper and right and natural and what is improper and wrong and unnatural. And... Uh, those are fierce distinctions in the minds of some people, and uh, they tend to uh, run in the face of, um, of scientific procedure because they're not scientific concepts. And uh, whenever religion and science get into conflict, uh, uh, except in the political way, it's religion that loses. Um, I, I think the literal interpretation of religious doctrine um, is... Um, a misinterpretation of what religion really is all about, but I, I won't go into that. All right. Well, that. let's come back to the wallet for a second. Here's a, a fact straightforward uh, from Louise. Thank you, Louise. It just says, kids can't wait now till their parents kick the bucket to get their money. <laughs> I'm curious. That's uh, probably true, isn't it? Well, there is that wonderful book out there. I forget who wrote it called Die Broke, <laughs> which, which advocates a, a different approach to uh, personal finance. <laughs> and then just one more before we go to the phones, and we'll go back to them. Art, we all thought that Ralph Nader was a bit of a nut on safety. Just wait until death by accident is virtually the only way anybody dies. People will be wearing a helmet and airbags when they go out to walk the dog. And speaking of dogs... Will we see the 50-year-old dog, the 80-year-old cat someday? <laughs> or, or with the way medical science works, uh, Dr. Klatz, might we see them first? Uh, you will see them first. We're seeing them now. We're seeing uh, laboratory mice that are living to the equivalent age of about 160 years of age. We have uh, really we have uh, fruit flies that are equivalent to about 180 years of age. We have 
roundworms are equivalent to age 300 to 500 years of age. Has there been any experimentation on uh, higher mammals, you know, cats, dogs, monkeys? Well, my dog was uh, was an experiment in progress, I suppose. I mean, uh, I didn't I didn't experiment with my dog before I, I first uh, got it worked out with uh, my patients and my, 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 my family members. Because uh, after all, it was my dog. I couldn't take any chances with him. But uh, Lex... Um, Lex the Wonder Dog, I called him. Uh, he uh, was a, uh, an incredible example of uh, the powers of anti-aging medical therapies. At 11, he was an old dog with gray hair and a gray nose and yes. uh, clouded eyes. And uh, uh, we put him on an anti-aging medicine program, and he, in the space of six months, uh, reverted back to um, the equivalent of an eight-year-old Airedale. He was running and frolicking with the uh, golden retriever down the block. Really? Oh, yes, and he went strong until age 16. Until uh, what finally uh, got him? Uh, well, he ended up with a stroke, and I rehabilitated him from the stroke, but the quality of his life had gone down. He, he, wasn't the, he wasn't the happy young puppy that he was just six months earlier. And after the stroke, he started having these, these, these minor uh, infections, and as soon as the quality of his life was gone... Uh, I wasn't, I, although I could have kept him going, I believe, for another year at least, maybe two, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to put him through that issue because that's not what anti-aging medicine is about. It's not about living a long life. It's living a high-quality life. That's what it's all about is a, a high-quality, productive, youthful life. And so I put him down at age 16 and a half, and that's the equivalent of about 116 years. Okay. But does that kind of beg the question that we were discussing earlier about the quality of life in the latter years? We we don't put down people. Well, not yet, anyway. Well, I mean, no, we don't. But uh, I mentioned earlier about these uh, senior athletes. What we're seeing is is that in our oldest old, the people who are senior athletes and the people who are age 100 and beyond, by the way, there are now 70,000 Americans age 100 and beyond. They're the fastest-growing segment of our population, by the way. And in these people who are... Well, that's too many to announce on the Today Show. The, and they've stopped announcing them, by the have, way. Have they really? Yes, they have, because there's just too many of them. Uh, Willard Scott just doesn't have that much airtime. But the point is, is that these people, when they do uh, go, they go relatively uh, pleasantly. Uh, they they get sick and they um, and they you know and they're sick for a few weeks maybe a few months and that's the end and it's over and it's not this heroic kind of we're going to spend ninety percent of all of the health care dollars that you've ever spent in your life in the last year or two trying to keep you alive with a star uh, with heroic means and it's really not keeping you alive it's just prolonging your death. Well, here's a practical question I can't resist since we've come down this road, and it is as follows. If people know that they can live for a very long time and the only way they're going to die is going to be some sort of violence, how do we get people to take hazardous jobs in this brave new world, like policemen uh, going to war as a soldier for our country, uh, being a fireman, something that might end your life dramatically and quickly? Well, I, don't, I think that would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it for a second. You mean having a hard time filling those jobs? Having a hard time filling those jobs because uh, I would like nothing better than to have a society where people are so concerned about their health and, and mortality uh, that they don't commit violent crimes because it's simply not worth it. Uh, where people don't go off to wars because their life is of such a high quality and such a, a value that they don't want to squander their life on war. Isn't that a, 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 a yeah, rather... It's a wonderful picture. It's so yeah. wonderful that it's unrealistic. Uh, well, well, unfortunately, I, 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 I acknowledge that. Uh, but I don't think we'll have a problem um, uh, filling, uh, uh, filling these uh, positions. There's, there are enough people who are, get off on the adventure and the adrenaline rush uh, that, um, you know, that, that will always be a pull for, for, for many people. More, uh, more skydiving and uh, bungee jumping and such. Well, if you're going to go, go. You know, wouldn't it be a lot more fun to go uh, with a broken bungee cord than it would be uh, to go from cancer or from a slow lingering degenerative disease? I mean, I'm planning on a lifespan of 150. I'm not sure. I've thought about the broken bungee cord thing, and it's not very attractive. 
Well, I realize well. it's quick, but it's it's not very attractive. Well, it's, uh, I, I'm planning on making it to 150 personally, but when I but but when the end comes, I want it to come bungee cord style. Uh, yeah, uh, of my own choosing, of my own decision, <laughs> not some horrible, uh, you know, not some horrible, uh, you know, um, uh, twist of fate. Um. This will be a hard question for you, Dr. Klatz, but if if we as a human race begin to live 150 years, 300 years, and an individual decides they have lived long enough at, say, 112, and they want to opt out, do you think that physicians should be able to help them do that comfortably? I think historically the role of a physician has been to assist their patient uh, both in achieving the highest quality of life that they can and the highest use of their life and the highest pursuit of health. Yes. And that sometimes that that included uh, the guarantee of a painless or a relatively painless um, uh, and uh, unburdensome and, and non-burdensome death. Yes, but but here we'd be facing a different question. Not so much say a decline in health, because you'd have that covered. Yeah, you're but, talking but, about. I'm talking about talking, somebody who gets to be 115 and says to gets himself, bored. Yeah, I've had enough. You know, I would have a difficult time with physicians helping people all shed their mortal coil because they were bored. Uh, I don't have such a problem with assisted suicide, however. With, they're two with different. They're two different issues. Very right? different issues. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I think I would have a problem with doctors just, uh, you know, taking people, giving people a, a way out simply because they're bored. I think if if they want if they want to uh, if they want to go, then it's time to go uh, bungee jumping with uh, defective bungee cords. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Howard, any comments on that? Well, it's interesting listening to this conversation between you. How many of these issues have been explored uh, through a variety of um, myths and stories? and artworks that have been bequeathed to us over the centuries, particularly the, the past 200 years, on the point of um, death by accident uh, in Bernard Shaw's play, Back to Methuselah, that's one of the major uh, issues uh, in the opening um, uh, scene where um, uh, Adam turns to Eve and says, look at this dead fawn. Isn't that strange? Someday this will happen to me. However long I live, however, however many years uh, uh, equal to the grains of sand on the beach, sooner or later I'm going to trip up and end up like the fawn. Um, in Janacek's opera, The Macropolis Case, it's the story of a 337-year-old woman who was bored out of her mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but partly the, the moral of that story is that um, she lived a long time, uh, but she kept repeating herself. She had something like a 320-year singing career, and that's a, a record, I think, in fiction. Um, Indeed. And so uh, uh, I think what uh, Dr. Klatz indirectly is referring to and uh, calling for and what many of these stories call for is uh, some recognition of the necessity of renewal. Uh, 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 otherwise, uh, boredom is a threat. All right. Uh, it's a threat if I keep people waiting too long. First yep. time caller line, you're on the air with Drs. Klatz and Howard. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is Tom in Buffalo, New York. Hello, Tom. Hi. Um, quick uh, comment on the uh, religious aspect. Uh, I think if um, sickness and death are good for the soul, I doubt if Jesus would have gone around uh, curing the sick and raising the dead, although some of his contemporaries, very learned authorities, claimed he was doing the work of the devil, I think they were wrong. Um, question, two, two questions, if I could, quickly. Um, number one, is it possible that they will find a medical cure for boredom, <laughs> uh, some sort of genetic um, correction? Or how about a mood-altering drug? We've got a few. Well, some, um, because boredom would be the issue. And uh, another completely different question is: um, finally, in the in the end, don't we have to die to be with God? Ah, <clears throat> uh, well, let's see. Who wants that one? <laughs> don't ask me. I haven't uh -huh. been there yet. <laughs> uh, with regard to boredom, boredom is uh, basically a function of uh, your choices and your opportunities in life. And anti-aging medicine is all about opportunities. It's about the opportunity to choose your own health care destiny and about having all the time that you could possibly want or need to achieve mastery in this lifetime. 
Uh, we all have a purpose on this planet, or at least I believe we have a purpose, and some of us uh, don't stay around long enough to achieve that purpose or even to discover that purpose, and that's the ultimate benefit of anti-aging medicine. And I think once you know what your purpose is, uh, you, it's very hard to be bored. Mm -hmm. I was bored out of my skull when I was uh, a teenager and when I was a, a, a young adult. And then mm -hmm. I got involved in, in my medical career, and I haven't been bored a day since I haven't had the time to be bored. And there would be, uh, as you point out, there would be time to find out what is right for you, mm -hmm. whereas now so many people do not. Uh, that certainly is an upside. Uh, there's no question about that. The second part of the question, do you need to die to be with God? Well, I certainly hope not. All right. Um, All right. We'll hold it right there. We'll be right back. All right, once again, back to our guests. And Dr. Howard is either in Cambridge right now, I think, in Massachusetts, yeah. or or somewhere up in New Brunswick, Canada. Which is it? <laughs> no, I'm in Cambridge. <laughs> You're in Cambridge at the yes. moment. All right. Um, Dr. Howard, is this a frequent uh, topic of conversation among your peers? That's a very good question. Um it depends on how you look at it. Uh, uh, I, I would not say that uh, the issues of longevity uh, or, or, or even of anti-aging medicine uh, have much exercised um, uh, moral and social philosophers up to now. Now, medical ethics is, of course, a burgeoning branch of, of philosophy and, and of um, uh, uh, you know, values in medical practice. Um, and I don't think it's going to be much longer before they get around to it, uh, particularly as this specialty, as Dr. Clark has reminded us, yeah. takes off and captures the public attention. Yes. And I think that's what, what, what is happening. Uh, it's been around for some time, but I think it's now becoming a public issue as people see the opportunities for taking control of their own, um, well, medical destiny, or at least uh, 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 greater control. Over All right, well, then, then, then that goes right back to the question. Uh, here I am, 115 years old, yes. uh, in good health, bored out of my skull, Yeah. and I really, for whatever reason, I want to end my life uh, philosophically. Yes. Um, how do you view that uh, with, with this well, new technology? Uh, it, it, it's... It, it, uh, I can link this to your other query. The, the, the many, many of the, of the stories and myths that we've inherited, uh, especially over the past 100 years, including even stories like uh, the Dracula and uh, Frankenstein uh, tales, um, uh, the portrait of uh, Dorian Gray, picture of Dorian Gray, yes. rather, uh, uh, deal with this sort of issue, but the, the wages of longevity, but you could put it that way, the, sure. um, the, the, the risks. Uh, now, admittedly, these people were engaged in creating uh, imaginative works of art, but uh, they were struggling with these issues. It's, it's the earthly dream. That's, 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 uh, it's different from the dream of, of, of immortality, but anybody interested in literature or uh, read stories like uh, Virginia Woolf's Orlando will know that this, these are the issues that these uh, people have been dealing with. So they're in the woodwork. They're in the literature. And I think as the public becomes more and more aware, practically speaking, then I, I think the ethical, social issues, even as they emerge out of literature uh, and, and art, will uh, come to the forefront. All right. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with uh, Drs. Uh, Klatz and Howard. Hi there. Hi, this is Joel in beautiful Orange County, California. Okay. And I, Dr. Klatz, I've been taking several uh, non-prescription anti-aging drugs for a few years, like melatonin, uh, DHEA, deprinyl citrate. I feel great. My immune system's strong, and I think they're terrific. I have two quick questions. But first, I just have one quick comment for you, Art. Um, someone can be bored out of their mind at 115 or at 70 or at 50. Yes. But I don't think that has anything to do with the benefits of anti-aging drugs. I mean, if they want to end right. their life, that's a whole other issue it mm -hmm. could be at any age. Right, but it, it is for physicians if we want to have a civilized world, an ethical, moral issue, isn't it? Oh, yeah, of course. There's no question about that. No. Um, my two quick question first is, Dr. Klatz, do you know about Deprinil Citrate and the FDA not only not approving it but now banning it from even being produced and sold and even in... Uh, no, that's not correct. 
Uh, Depranil's, Depranil is, is sold, and it's FDA approved, and it's sold under the name Elderprel, which has side effects, and it doesn't have the same benefits as Depranil. Well, no, no, they're, they're very similar. The, the drug is essentially identical. Uh, there's a lot of marketing hype behind this company that uh, manufactures Depranil Citrate, which is a liquid product, which has been yanked off the market. Um, I'm not happy to see uh, restriction uh, of any uh, safe medication uh, for political reasons, uh, and that's probably what's going on. The company that was manufacturing, and I won't mention their name, they they, they kind of flew in the face of a lot of regulations of the FDA and really tried to sk- skirt the issue and sell directly to the public uh, this drug, which is uh, a prescription drug. What does it do, Doctor? Uh, Depranil is, uh, was originally developed... Well, it is marketed in the United States as an anti-Parkinson's drug, but it has some other interesting side effects. It has um, a beneficial effect on depression. It protects the brain. It's a nootropic agent, and that means it protects the brain uh, from toxic damage that occurs with aging, and it may be able to help revitalize some of the uh, brain cells that are not dead, but are kind of in a resting state or in a, you know, in a, that have been damaged that are, you know, that can be rehabilitated and can be rejuvenated. Uh, and so Depranil has, uh, very profound anti-aging effects in dogs and in rats. And, uh, we think that it may have some profound, it, that it may have some anti-aging effects in people. We don't know yet because it hasn't been studied in people for that effect, but it certainly is a good drug for Parkinson's disease, may work for Alzheimer's. Okay, well, why has it been banned? No, no, the, uh, the, the thing that the, the, the caller is calling about is a liquid form, yes. which is being marketed outside, uh, you know, by mail order. Oh. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the prescription drug being done. I see. Um, so, uh, well, that's what we're supposed to have the FDA for, to do testing and to determine something is safe uh, to be consumed. Right, and, uh, and it's a, it's just um, it's just an issue of whether the FDA will allow prescription drugs to be sold outside of the normal channels, and certainly they don't want that to happen. If we get an anti-aging drug, uh, a really good anti-aging drug, they're going to be testing that one till uh, till all of us are pushing up the days. <laughs> well, that's another story, and 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 certainly the human growth hormone story. Uh, it fits that equation very well, but uh, we'll have to say that for another night because it's a long story. <laughs> I bet it is. East of the Rockies, uh, you are on the air with Dr. Howard and Dr. Platts. Hi there. Oh, how you doing, Art? Uh, oh, this is right. Ted in Houston. Yes, sir. Uh, I sort of want to echo the last caller and uh, and give a more realistic uh, echo to the facts that you began the last segment with. Uh, uh, last, uh, two nights ago, I was trying to find uh, sources of uh, Renutrient or Fearon on the Internet, and apparently uh, they've been uh, put under uh, FDA control and restriction by a new law that just went into effect three days ago uh, because there is, uh, again, some possibility for abuse of these uh, medications. But for the most part, for the most people that use them, they're uh, very positive medicines. Are you there? No, I'm here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm here too. I'm just waiting. Okay, to see well, if somebody Renutrien wants to is uh, is GHP, which was banned uh, for very spurious reasons. Uh, it was uh, this is the date rape drug that uh, the media's yeah, yeah, been that's oh. beating their beating their chest about over oh. the last few months. And uh, the interesting thing with GHP is GHP has been used by the bodybuilding community for years. Uh, very safe uh, substance when used appropriately. Uh, Why is it called the date rape? Rape drug. I mean, what does it do? Well, if you take it and in very large quantities, like tablespoon quantities, yes. with alcohol, it does make you drowsy and tipsy and sleepy. And apparently, uh, some individuals have induced their dates to take enough of this stuff I, to I make see. them drowsy and tipsy. And uh, their their friends have claimed that they had date rape occur to them. I see. But it's very hard to mask the, the unpleasant flavor of this particular substance, and it's an un, and literally an average individual would have to take a, a tablespoon or more in alcohol. Uh, but uh, it's a, it made a really good media story, uh, and uh, it was uh, blown way out of proportion, and so much so that the federal government uh, enacted it by act of Congress 
has reclassified this substance as a controlled uh, a controlled substance. Wow. I never did know the story behind that. West of the Rockies, uh, you're on the air with Dr. Klatz and Dr. Such Howard. That's the power of the media art. Yeah, I guess so, huh? <laughs> Hello there, West of the Rockies. Are you there? Hi, Art. Hi. Uh, I, just one comment, well, a comment and a question. Um, when uh, Dr. Vernon was talking about we wouldn't be in such a rush and we'd have more time, and that's all relative. Being human beings, we'd be doing the same thing we're doing now. Um, but... I wanted to ask Dr. Vernon, and I'm assuming this is the Dr. Vernon that's written a number of books. Dr. Vernon and Howard, I think you do have I mean, a number of books, don't you, Doctor? Uh, I do have a number of books, but there's a danger of confusing me with uh, another Vernon Howard, uh, uh, who some years ago uh, uh, used to write uh, self-help pamphlets. Uh, oh, I'm I thought... not that person at all. Oh, I see. I, I, I I'm a scholar and a teacher, that. and he fancied himself a... Uh, um, uh, a, uh, a counselor to the stars, meaning the Hollywood stars, and I've never had a, I've had many star students, but never a Hollywood star in my class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was assuming that's probably who you were. It's, it's, no, I'm not. With the philosophy and everything. Right. Well, well. I, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity for for making uh, that difference clear. Well, I had no idea there were two of you. Or uh, two. It, it just so happens. Uh, mm -hmm. I usually publish under V A Howard, not uh, uh, or Vernon A. As, as, as this other fellow uh, publishes under, well, the same name, but without the A. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I wanted to ask him, ask you about one of his books, I guess. Uh, uh, I don't really know much about them. Uh, I, I, I couldn't comment. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, dear. Thank you for the call, and uh, take care. First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Uh, Howard uh, and Dr. Clance. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Where are you? Uh, we're in Sutherland, Oregon. Okay. 11:20, and um, I wanted to tell you of um, there is a, a company in Canada, and I won't say if you don't want me to, and they have a lot of supplements. Um, you know they're already anti-aging, and um, my husband and mother-in-law had um, some amazing results in taking sulfur or MSM, and my mother-in-law had two years to live with her kidney disease and three weeks later after taking it why she said she never she felt like she'd never been sick and um so it's good it builds new cells and um it's good for a lot of things but my husband has arthritis and he says he feels 20 years younger do you have any specific and, question ma'am no, I just wanted to bring that up to everyone. <laughs> Art, this is Dr. Klotz. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of callers are interested in these anti-aging drugs. Obviously. And, uh, on our website at uh, www.worldhealthnet with the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, our website has literally thousands of pages, several hundred of them devoted to new anti-aging drug therapies and nutrients and really uh, an in-depth look at many of these uh, uh, of these new therapies that are out there, and our site is completely non-commercial. You, you need to be very careful on the Internet because so many of the sites are selling a product. We don't sell anything, and we're a non-profit medical society, so we try and walk that uh, very very straight and narrow line of uh, being scientific and accurate. Uh, but what we do offer on our website at worldhealth.net is uh, information that addresses almost all aspects of anti-aging, pharmacology, treatment, uh, and with uh, Dr. Howard's help and uh, uh, Tufts University, we're even going to start delving into the philosophical and sociological issues of aging that will be on our website as well. Oh, it will. Yes, yes, we're planning on adding uh, uh, th those topics and those issues to uh, uh, to our site. Well, that'll make quite a forum, I'll tell you. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're There's on the air. There's actually a, um, uh, yes. a discussion board on immortality already. All right, uh, East of the Rockies, uh, hold on one second. There is? Yes, there is. Uh, at World Health Net under monument.net. Mm -hmm. That <laughs> ought to be quite a discussion. All right, East of the Rockies, you're on the air uh, with uh, Dr. Klatz and Howard. Hi. Yes, I do have a question over uh, the fact that um, aging in society will, uh, I think, really will cause a lot of problems in our society. You mean a lack of aging? Uh, well, lack of aging, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, because a lot of new ideas and things like that come from younger people. Uh, people, as they get older, uh. do have a tendency to accept what they have. 
uh, where the young don't. I mean, uh, the fresh uh, uh, perspective. As I oh, but that. you've fallen right into Dr. Klatz's trap. You see, because he's saying that um, this additional age you'll have will be a healthy, productive age. Yeah, but uh, 80% of the people around here don't actually do anything other than work and then go home and watch TV or listen to the radio. The famous useless eaters. Yes. Dr. Klatz. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how to respond other than uh, the belief that uh, as people uh, gain uh, more resources and more control and more power over their lives where they don't have to work. You know, that's another spin-off of the Ageless Society is people won't have to work, that they will actually have real, useful, leisure time. Mm. And that's something that we've never really seen in our society. Well, we're actually trained against that. I mean, uh, we, yes. we are absolutely mind-conditioned against that. We are trained to be productivity is everything, uh, but there Cli come... Climbing socially and uh, financially, it's everything. Yes, but there will come a time in the not-too-distant future where there will be a large segment of our population, which I believe will be called the leisure class. And uh, these people will be people who have, worked their who have worked their 20 years and are looking forward not to another 10 or 15 years of disease and disability and finally death, as the golden years are today, but we'll be looking forward to another 50 years of youthful, productive lifespan, and uh, they won't necessarily have to spend it in the workplace. It won't be necessary. They'll have the opportunity to go back to college or to explore uh, new avenues or self-mastery, and that's, the I think, the bright future and the hope of anti-aging medicine. Uh, I'm hoping that you're wrong, Art, and that uh, this, uh, this uh, utopian vision is achievable. Whew. All right, West of the Rockies, without a lot of time, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Klatz and Dr. Howard. Hello. Hi, Art. Uh, one time you had a caller that called in and said that her doctor had advised her that cancer survivors should not take, like, human growth stimulators, and I wonder if the doctors had any opinions on that. Some lady did say that, yes. Yeah, I was wondering what the doctors had to say about uh, that. Yeah, in other words, uh, doctor, somebody who, who has uh, had just had a bout with cancer, mm -hmm. the uncontrolled growth of uh, cells, might be tampering with something they ought not if they're prone to... Certainly. Yeah. Um, the latest evidence on human growth hormone, and it was a concern uh, with uh, prostate cancer with human growth hormone. Uh, the latest reports on human growth hormone is that there is no association between it and cancer, certainly at least not prostate cancer. Some cancers are stimulated by growth factors, whether they be testosterone, estrogen, human growth hormone, or whatever it is that's a stimulatory agent. If you have cancer, you really need to, if you're doing anti-aging medicine, period, you need to be under a physician's supervision. Because sure. this is not, you know, this isn't like taking a little extra vitamin C every day. This is a very complex, um, complicated type of therapeutics that requires laboratory analysis and lots of it. For the real downtown version of anti-aging, you know, when you come in with uh, whatever dollars you need, uh, to undergo uh, a year-by-year -year program, how expensive is it? If you're relatively healthy, you could get by for as little as fifteen hundred dollars. If you're that's per, a little bit of, that's per year, right? Per year. All right. Uh, that's for the diagnostics and for the you know for the medical program. If you're going to now, that doesn't include your nutrients. Uh, most people who are on anti-aging medicine are are spending about a hundred to two hundred dollars a month in nutrients. Okay. Uh, if you have something wrong with you that needs to be fixed or you have or your advanced age and we need to undo a lot of the damage that has been done, you might spend upwards of five or six thousand a year for the medical and the diagnostics associated with an anti aging medicine program so in other words you're suggesting that even with a, an abused body uh it's possible at a greater expense to begin to reverse the damage done uh, we do it all the time. Uh, I have patients who are on this program who are uh, in their 90s who are doing very, very well. I mean, incredi I mean, ex extraordinarily well. All right, listen, this program is ending. Uh, we're flat out of time. So a final can word. I give that last number again, or could you give that number again so people of can call Of course, for that free $25 package. Huh. And uh, Dr. Howard, any final words? Uh, I would like to thank you both very much for making this both a pleasurable as well as an adventurous time. 
Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Judge. And it's thanks to the both of you. <laughs> All right.